of the most hard-fought and controversial budget areas, the legislature ultimately provided $2.64 billion over the next two years to fund the Department of Public Safety, the Department of Corrections, and the court system. I spoke with the chair of the Senate Judiciary and Public Safety Committee, Warren Limmer, about a few aspects of the new law. As with many of the omnibus budget bills, there is so much to cover in this one. I'd like to begin by talking about women and children because there are a number of new policies and changes that will impact the lives of women and children. Can you describe just a few of them? Thanks, Shannon, for having me. Uh, this last year was really uh, complex, difficult, and uh, we still were under, under the disguise of uh, COVID. So we were doing all of our meetings, complicated meetings through a Zoom process which is very difficult. Uh, but uh, moving on, we, we did have a focus uh, on women and children and how they get involved in the criminal justice system. I think the most notable one was uh, a project that we started last year. And that was the Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women uh, Task Force. And we authorized that task force for about a year and a half. And as a result, uh, we came up with a number of recommendations. These are claims that there were uh, women and children, notably from Native American communities, that over many, many years have been ignored in their claim that, that these women were either murdered or they mysteriously became missing along with their children. We've talked with law enforcement uh, up in those areas and law enforcement doesn't really have a clear idea of what they're talking about. So as a result of the task force, there seems to be enough smoke to think there's fire there. So what we did is we extended the task force into an office, an official office uh, to continue studying this issue. We also expanded it into another task force, murdered and missing African-American women that were in the same category. And so we, want to, we don't want to ignore anyone if there has been a victim, a missing person, or tragically a murdered person that has not met uh, a standard of justice. We want to make sure that we ignore no one and pursue that. We also increased um, uh, intervention programs, youth intervention programs, getting kids off of streets, getting them into projects through the summer, uh, during the school year. Also, we also recognize that when kids do get involved in juvenile justice issues, they're eventually gonna go to a juvenile court. For some reason, um, it's been a pattern in the court system to bring the defendant child into a courtroom shackled with handcuffs, oftentimes with ankle bracelets, bring them in and then unlock those chains in front of the judge, in front of uh, any, other, any other person that might be in the courtroom. And uh, we were convinced that there's enough trauma on a young person that they don't necessarily need that. You've got a big system, you've got a court system, you have bailiffs there uh, for security. In the event that a court or a judge thinks that that person is a real threat they can continue with the shackling, but the default is going to be no child is going to have shackles on when they go in front of a courtroom. So uh, I think that's going to be a positive case. We also started one in uh, corrections. Uh, Senator Kiffmeyer brought forward a proposal uh, regarding uh, a Healthy Start Act, and that's for women who are already convicted, they're in a prison setting, but they might be pregnant, they might be uh, postpartum. Uh, we're gonna allow that particular person to keep their child in the system or they could temporarily leave if they're not a violent threat for a short period of time, maybe even up to a year, so they can create that bonding with that child. And at the same time, um, kind of subconsciously, they're going to learn that there's other priorities in their life other than just themselves and criminal behavior. And uh, we're hoping that that will reduce recidivism with women inmates. I'd like to turn, if, if, you, if you don't mind, I'd like to turn to another topic. Uh, 
And it's the one that everyone was talking about all session long, and it was the one that you've said yourself was the most challenging, and that is threading that needle with police reform. The Republican-led yeah. Senate said no reforms could undermine law enforcement, and the DFL House wanted to ensure that deaths like those of George Floyd and Dante Wright would never happen again. So yeah. what was passed that met the balance of those two sides, if you will? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. You know, we, uh, we approached it in a balanced approach. Uh, we knew that there was claims for reform in policing in Minnesota. It was really highlighted by last year's death of George Floyd. And we did immediately meet. We did have reform bills passed in the middle of a special session, a mere 10 to 14 days after that tragic occurrence uh, happened. But we continued that discussion this year. Uh, however, we wanted to approach it in a balanced way. The other side was focusing on all total reform. And we began to realize, yes, reform in some areas were needed, but at the same time, we we're experiencing, uh, and we still are, uh, record-breaking violent crime in the Twin Cities, and it's expanding into the suburbs. And these are not only violent crimes; these are shootings. These are these are gunshots of um, street gangs that don't hit their target, but they've been hitting kids. Uh, a little girl was shot right off a trampoline and died. Uh, another little girl, two years old, was eating ice cream cone in the back seat of her car. She she was the target, uh, inadvertent target of a of a bullet that uh, killed her. And we began to realize we need a balanced approach. We're going to recognize reform, and this is what we did. Uh, we we came forward first with the law enforcement. We uh, we continued with forensic science, drug analysts because of the drug increase in the state of Minnesota. We expanded violent crime enforcement teams to go after drugs as well as the crime on light rail uh, in the metropolitan area. We removed that voluntary intoxication defense for rape. You might recall that uh, if, if someone was, uh, was out drinking and they became drunk. They could, and if they were a victim of a rape right after that, we recognized that cannot be used as a defense for a rapist. So we removed that out of our state law. We increased penalties for sex traffickers, created a new law on child torture. Uh, the Matson Strong Bill was uh, stiff, stiffer penalties for those who are wanting to attempt to kill a police officer. And it went on and on. However, our reform measure uh, that we balanced with this was we secured more training for police officers, $6 million per year. Uh, and we named it after Flando Castile. It was a reminder to law enforcement that there are victims that um, have no real explanation of why they were shot and killed. Uh, despite the fact that that police officer was exonerated, it still leaves in the community. Uh, uh, well, I guess I call it a heart issue. They're concerned about it and that they see it as an example of police uh, abuse. We increased, increased body cameras for law enforcement officers, for state law enforcement, BCA, Corrections, DNR. Uh, we created a response for inmate incarceration in county jails called the uh, hardell Sherrill Act. That's an individual who was neglected and he eventually died at the uh, hands of neglect by a correction officer. Uh, we modified uh, post board requirements. We included uh, databases on police misconduct. So we have a running total. If there is a, a police officer who has a continuous issue with that, we codified no-knock warrant limitations that you just simply can't uh, go forward and um, take a, uh, have a no-knock warrant issued without or under the circumstances of just a simple possession. 
it would have to be a sizable amount. Senator Limmer, I hate to interrupt you, but we are close to out of time, and I want to get one more one more comment from you. At the end of session, you said that you hope to take the Judiciary Committee on the road during the interim to talk to people around the state about various topics. What do you want to investigate further? I think the, uh, the one issue that remains unanswered and it continues to fester uh, between people groups is uh, a racial um, relationship between um, people of color and law enforcement and other figures of authority with government. I don't think there's uh, necessarily an issue, a pronounced issue between separate people groups, but I think it all pivots off of government and how we respond. Are we, are we responding in the correct way? Are we recognizing cultural differences? There's an anger there that, and a hurt that I think is crying for a sense of justice and we need to analyze it before we make judgment on it. Uh, I think it's important to realize that type of thing. I'm gonna personally go out and search it out first and then hopefully I can get the committee to focus on some of that as well. Senator Limmer, there's so much in this bill. I want to thank you for just getting the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, I'm sorry to be so wordy, but it was a big bill. It was a big bill. Thank you so much.